This is Small Changes in Teaching, Big Results in Learning by John Fanzalo, presented by the Tephalology Podcast. Hi, this is Matthew from the Tephalology Podcast. In 2017, John Fanzalo released his latest book, Small Changes in Teaching, Big Results in Learning, following on from his previous publications, Breaking Rules, Contrasting Conversations, and Try the Opposite. The theme you see in these titles reveals John's focus on challenging preconceptions while offering very practical advice about language teaching. The Teflology Podcast is pleased to present a special limited series featuring a selection of chapters from Small Changes, Big Results, in audio form, read by John himself. This first episode is an edited version of the introduction, foreword, and preface of the book. Enjoy. John F. Fanslow here. Welcome to the audio book version of a book I wrote and produced, Small Changes in Teaching, Big Results in Learning, Videos, Activities, and Essays to Stimulate Fresh Thinking, about language, teaching, and learning. This is an introduction to the audiobook version of the Kindle and print versions, which are available through Amazon. This advice, you can change the world, but please don't, unless you know what you're doing, which I heard in a talk at Teachers College, Columbia University, by James Garbarino about bullying and school shootings in the U.S. resonated with me because it is a central theme of small changes in teaching, big results in learning. All too often school districts, ministries of education, and politicians propose new plans to stop bullying, improve learning, or increase test scores. Most of these have little effect because the mandates provide no release time or training for teacher preparation, no practical details about implementation, and no methods to explore the extent to which the prescribed methods produce the hoped for better outcomes. Since I was first asked to supervise teachers practice teaching, in a teacher training college in Nigeria 57 years ago, I have seen teacher preparation and ways to improve teaching and learning as a joint enterprise of exploration, rather than a series of directives from ministries, school districts, and politicians. Why? Well, initially, because the Nigerian teachers I supervised in practice teaching had more experience than I had and were teaching material I was not familiar with, such as Nigerian history, geography, and monetary system, to name just a few of these topics. Ignorance can be a great teacher if it leads you to try to find new ways. From conversations with my graduate students through the years, I came to understand that I was ignorant of the fact that most teacher preparation materials I used, and some that I had written, took too long to read and described activities that were very often difficult to understand, much less put into practice. I realized that materials were needed that contained activities that could be easily learned in minutes rather than hours, that showed students doing the activities on videos, and that enabled teachers not only to expand the range of their activities, but also to see the extent to which the new activities were successful or not. In the readings and videos in Small Changes in Teaching, Big Results in Learning, I illustrate ways to analyze one-page transcripts of recordings of our teaching and of classroom interactions, make small changes, and compare the results. 
Why just one page transcripts? Well, because I know teachers are busy. And also because there are dozens and dozens of communications in every class. Way too many to transcribe all of, much less analyze, if you are a teacher. Yet, from a one page transcript, you can see at the minimum what language your students understand and do not understand and what they need to work on. This provides precise details about what you need to teach and eliminates the need to make, give, and grade tests. The transcripts, though, show us more than what we need to teach. They enable us to understand how what we do, what we plan or want to do, and what we think we do are very different. Much of what we do is out of consciousness. And all teachers who begin analyzing transcripts are surprised at how much they do that they are unaware of. And how much their students say that they do not hear during the class. These discoveries are magnified if they also watch video recordings of their classes. So we find out not only what students need to learn, but also what we and our students are actually doing. With this knowledge, we can begin to analyze our teaching and to generate alternative ways to teach and to have our students engage with materials and interact with us and each other in different ways. The alternatives that I advocate are based on my ideas about learning and teaching. They are not generated randomly. To me, teaching is reminding learners of what they already know. And learning is predicting and doing and using language. So, for example, if a teacher decides to explain grammar rules for 10 minutes rather than 5 minutes, it is not an alternative that fits these beliefs. Talking at people does not allow either prediction or doing or using language. Though I spent the majority of my professional life coordinating the graduate programs in TESOL at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City and Tokyo, I have also learned from teachers I worked with for extended periods in Nigeria, as I said earlier, and in New Zealand, Senegal, Somalia, Spain, and Togo. And I have seen teachers from scores of countries use activities in my videos and readings successfully. I wore shoes till I lived in Nigeria. When I got athlete's foot during hot and humid summers in Chicago, I bought off-the-counter ointments and they relieved the symptoms somewhat. In Nigeria, the temperature and the humidity were much higher than those I had experienced in Chicago. The off-the-counter ointments had very little effect. So I went to a doctor and asked for a prescription ointment. He said that there was no need for ointment. All I had to do was wear sandals. Well, as I said, I had worn shoes all my life, and I thought of all sorts of reasons why sandals would not be a good option. They would not support my arches well. My feet would get dirty from the dust in the places where I walked. Insects would bite my toes. They seemed too casual to wear with the shirt and tie that I wore when teaching, and people would smell the odor of my feet. The doctor refused to prescribe ointments and insisted I try his suggested alternative. So I bought a pair of sandals. None of my fears materialized. My feet had no odors. The small amount of dust that accumulated I could shake off in a heartbeat on my doorstep. The sandals I bought had strong arch support. My students said they thought that sandals were more stylish with shorts in the tropical rainforest. They said they had thought it strange for me to wear shoes. I continued to wear sandals after I returned to New York because my feet continued to be so healthy. When I went to buy a new pair, my wife, who is Japanese, was with me. The salesperson asked me whether I ever visited Japan. I said, oh, I often did. He said that he would like me to try on a pair of sandals without straps. He knew that the Japanese remove their shoes before entering their homes. If you use these sandals, you won't have to bend over or sit down each time you enter and leave to strap and unstrap your sandals. I said that the sandals would fall off. He said they would not fall off. 
I said that when I drive, they will not stick to my right foot, and as a result, they will not be able to brake quickly. He kept saying that there is no difference between sandals with and without straps as far as keeping them on goes. I said I found that very hard to believe. He got up abruptly and returned with a pair of sandals without straps. He gently removed my sandals with straps and put the sandals without straps on. He said, please walk. I walked. They did not fall off. They were just as secure and comfortable as those with straps. Skepticism. We are all creatures of habit, both inside and outside of our classrooms. We follow rules that we have unconsciously learned. We get used to doing things in a particular way that we find comfortable. One result of this fact is that just as I resisted sandals and then sandals without straps, when people suggest alternative activities for our teaching, we conjure up all sorts of reasons why the alternative activities will not work. When we feel comfortable doing what we do, we continue acting the same way. I wrote this book to provide alternative activities that are very different from many widely accepted practices in the field of language teaching, which I consider past their use-by date and expiration date. Many are based on claims rather than proven effectiveness and observation. My suggestion is for you to be as skeptical about your present practices as the alternatives I urge you to try. Ask how widely advocated pre-reading activities such as brainstorming, scaffolding, predicting what a text is about might not only be useless but also detrimental to learning. Question the value of memorizing individual words on note cards with the first language equivalent on the back of the cards. Consider ways that asking students to define words or using the words in sentences, repeating words in isolation, memorizing rules in either English or students' first languages, having students in pairs talk about their favorite songs, sports, or whatever, might be detrimental. A singular message. I have never seen anyone else share this message at the beginning of each class or at the beginning of workshops or presentations that teacher educators make. Believe nothing I say. But if I am true to the question I started with, question everything, then you must not only not believe anything I say, but anything anyone else says. Do one of your usual activities. Make a small change and compare the effects over and over and over. If you follow these steps, you will see how much more you and your students are capable of, you will discover that inertia can be overcome with often exhilarating results. The changes I suggest are small, just as changing from shoes to sandals with straps to sandals without straps are small, but the results are very big. They are also very easy to employ, just as changing what we wear on our feet is very easy to do. For me, the biggest issues in ELT are the lack of skepticism, which I just mentioned, the acceptance of prescriptions and labels. The second is our failure to analyze what we and our students actually do. All too often we discuss what we do in plan lessons using labels with positive connotations. Pre-reading activities, scaffolding, positive feedback, pair work, communicative activities, recasting, comprehension, check, activization of prior knowledge, experiential learning, to name nine of dozens. We use this terms the same way doctors use low density and high density cholesterol and vitamin B12, but the terms in our field are very, very imprecise. Yet we use them to say what we do rather than record and transcribe what we do. Calling what is the title of this text a comprehension question does not make it a comprehension question. Saying that in my combination of sketches and words with letters left out to express, we were nothing I say, I am scaffolding, does not mean the message is scaffolding. The third issue is the belief that doing A results in B. Pick a few key words from the text. Seven to ten is usually a good number. Have the students write a brief story using each word. This familiarizes students with the vocabulary using the text. Not only will this help improve reading comprehension, it will improve writing skills as well. How can the so-called key words familiarize students with the text since they have not seen the text? How can writing a story using each word, many of which they probably are not familiar with, improve their writing? 
Writing is not using unfamiliar words to write a story with no purpose, no audience, and no theme. Forget terms. Forget claims about using keywords and stories to improve reading comprehension and writing. Let's look at the reality of what we do by analyzing recordings and 20 to 30 transcribed lines of what we and our students do. Describe what was said and done by each participant without using one label. Change what is done and said a little. Record and transcribe the small changes and compare the results over and over and over. Describe what we do without jargon and with as few preconceived notions as possible. How is what we think is useful not useful? And how is what we think is not useful possibly useful? What do our students think about what we do? I am advocating nothing more than what explorers have urged for centuries. Sit before a fact as a little child and be prepared to give up every preconceived notion. Follow humbly wherever and to whatever abyss nature leads or you shall learn nothing. This is what Thomas Huxley said more than a century ago. How it all began. My first full-time teaching position was in Nigeria. In addition to teaching English to primary school teachers in a teacher training college, I was required to supervise the practice teaching two problems. One, the teachers I was supervising each had from four to twenty more years' experience than I had. Two, they were teaching Nigerian history, the currency system adapted from England, pounds, shillings, pence, British systems of measurement such as poles, rods, and perches, etc. Information that was all new to me. Fortunately for me, in the primary schools where the teachers with much more experience and knowledge than I had to practice teaching, there were two primary one classes, two primary two classes, all the way up to primary six. Also, the timetable mandated that each stream study the same subjects at the same time each day. I decided that the only way I could be the least bit helpful would be to observe the first 20 minutes of the first period in one stream and the second 20 minutes of the first period in the other stream. I wrote down as much as what each teacher said and did as I could with the intention of sharing what the teachers did with each other. As it turned out, I was able to write down more than 50% of the interactions. One reason I was able to do this was because the teachers wrote a lot on the board for students to copy. Had they spoken more, I would not have been able to take such copious notes. At the end of the day, when I met the two teachers teaching primary one, for example, I would say, Ocon, Benedict wrote the date and all the directions on the board and had the students copy them as they looked at the board. You said the date and had the students look at the board, then look only at their notebooks and write what they remember. Ocon, tomorrow do what Benedict did, and Benedict, please do what Ocon did. The next day I asked them to describe what differences the small changes I had suggested had made. In some cases they didn't see any differences in the results. In other cases they saw big differences. When students wrote from memory rather than copied, for example, they made more mistakes. When the teachers saw the mistakes, they realized that they had to have their students practice more. As you know, the number of radii in a circle is infinite. But as every analysis of classroom interactions and textbook activities has shown, the number of activities done in classrooms is almost always very, very limited. Asking students who erase any all the mistakes they make to keep their erasers in their pencil cases is an activity that is unusual in some countries. Mariko thought that when she gave dictations, all of her students wrote exactly what she said because there were never any errors in their notebooks. However, when she looked at a video clip of her class, she saw that the students were erasing and writing while she wrote the correct sentences on the board. She had told them to compare what they wrote with the sentences on the board. But instead of only comparing, they were rushing to fix without time to process or question what they heard. The next day, Mariko asked them to keep their erasers in their pencil cases. After she said, I like ice cream, three times, she did not write the sentence on the board. The next time she checked the students' notebooks, only 10 out of 40 students had written, I like ice cream. Instead, she read such phrases as, I cream, 
I ice, I spring, like ice. After that, she asked the students to correct what they had written with a different colored pen. This would allow the students to compare their mistakes with what was correct later on and allow the teacher to find out what the students could understand and not understand. In Nigeria, I did not say how nice the teachers were with the students, nor did I say that what they did they should not have done. Almost all exchanges after supervisors observed practice teachers, or after principals observed teachers, consist of only three kinds of conversations. In one, the person in charge says how lovely the teacher's rapport is, how the students were so enthusiastic, how good the lesson was. I call this the make nice conversation. Another type includes critical comments by the person observing the class and suggestions and prescriptions for how to do things better. The supervisor selects examples to fit the judgments. Your report was great, but you failed to notice that the three students in the back of the class were text messaging when you stated the goals of the lesson. You must be more attentive to your students. The third type consists of the supervisor and teacher making claims using jargon and general terms. You use scaffolding and brainstorming and icebreakers in the beginning of the lesson, which activated the student's mind so they understood more. You had them do communicative activities in pairs after they listened to the recording so they could better understand what they had heard. I loved your comprehension questions because the students could answer them all correctly. Is what was the author's name a comprehension question? Is when was the book a comprehension question? Synonyms for comprehension include grasp, perceive, interpret, be aware of, and understand. Many so-called comprehension questions are similar to the two I just wrote. They ask for the recall of facts. It is, of course, possible to know the name of an author and the date of a book without having any understanding of the title, much less any of the text. Scaffolding, brainstorming, icebreakers, communicative activities, comprehension. These terms mean totally different things to different people. I think using jargon and general terms to make claims is detrimental to teacher awareness and development. Instead, I focus on analyzing what students and teachers actually do. If you record students doing pair work and see they make two to five errors in each sentence, you realize that so-called communicative activities more deeply ingrain errors rather than develop students' language. If you see that in a class of 40 students, it is always the same five students who answer the teacher's so-called comprehension questions, you cannot continue to claim that the questions are effective because the students answer them correctly. In Nigeria, I describe in detail one or two actions each teacher carried out and asked them to try the other's activities, which were alternatives for them. And in our next discussions, I asked them what differences, if any, the small changes had made. Because they were busy teaching, they often could not notice any different results. But since all I had to do was observe and write notes, I could notice different or similar results. When I shared descriptions of what they did, as well as the results of small changes, both the teachers and I were often surprised. Nurses and doctors make mistakes when treating patients. Like students, they often try to hide their errors. The nurses at one hospital were told that if they made a mistake and reported it, they would be given $200 with the condition that they would then agree to be video recorded while working. One nurse reported that she miscounted tablets for a patient, a non uncommon error. Later recordings revealed that she was counting as a, at the nurse's station, and when she was counting, visitors came and asked her for patient's room numbers. One, two painkillers, one muscle relaxant. Oh, Mr. Gray in 205, two muscle relaxants. As a result of seeing how the miscounting was being caused by interruption from visitors, the nurses decided to put a sign on the desk, Please do not disturb. I will answer your questions as soon as I finish counting these pills. This small change reduced the number of mistakes by 90%. Many economists have claimed that the more choices consumers have, the more they buy. A few economists decided to find evidence to support or refute this claim. They placed five brands of strawberry jam at the entrance of a supermarket for a few days. They tallied the number of jars consumers bought. A couple of weeks later, they placed 25 brands of strawberry jam in the same location. 
After a few days, they discovered that the number of jars of jam that people purchased was much, much lower than when consumers had only five choices. Another claim that economists questioned was that if an unemployment counselors asked the unemployed they were helping to find jobs to detail what they had done the previous week to find the job, they would more likely find a job. A few counselors had told their director that few of the people they asked details about what they had done the previous week could remember. Hardly any of the unemployed had a notebook in which they noted what companies they had visited and when. The director gave the counselors permission to change what they were doing. Instead, they jointly made plans for what the unemployed were going to do the following week rather than interrogate them about what they had done the previous week. On Monday, you can visit Seiji in the morning. In the afternoon, you can visit Roseanne, which is close by. The unemployed person wrote down the week's schedule, which was jointly planned with the counselor. Asking what people were going to do rather than what they had done decreased the time it took people to find jobs and increased the number who found jobs by a very large percentage. Small changes, big results occur not only in language teaching, but also in most areas of our life. Observe, change just one factor, and compare the results. Nothing new, just a short version of the scientific method. William Blake, the English poet, printmaker, and painter, advocating focusing on details and pointed out the danger of general claims. He who would do good to another must do it in minute particulars. General good is the plea of the scoundrel, hypocrite, and flatterer. For art and science cannot exist but in minutely organized particulars, and not in generalizing demonstrations of the rational power. These days, just as hospitals can record what staff members do to better understand how they make mistakes, we can record what we and our students say. We can take digital photographs of the board and pages from student notebooks, and students can record pair work on their cell phones. As a result, we have much more accurate data available to compare the results of making small changes that I had with only a pen and notebook when I observed practice teachers in Nigeria. In these readings, I illustrate ways you can compare the results of activities you presently use and small changes you make as you experiment with your teaching and question the value of widely accepted practices as well as your preconceived notions or assumptions about teaching. You previously read that when Mariko told her students to put their erasers in their pencil cases when she said sentences she wanted them to write, she realized that when she had previously dictated sentences, they had erased their errors before she could see them. So she, of course, had assumed that they wrote what she had said correctly. You see that these conversations do not make nice, criticize, and make judgments, or use jargon and general terms rather than actual communications. They are based on the analysis of transcriptions, video clips, and pages from student notebooks. Data, not perceptions, of what teachers and students did. If you try to understand what you are doing, what you want to do, and what you think you are doing, using the assumptions I base my suggestions on, you are more likely to see things you did not see before than if you just look at what you are doing in random ways. As you and your students explore distinctive activities, you will realize that as helpful as what others tell us is, we each have to discover new ways and words on our own. Walt Women, in Leaves of Grass, 1855, said this more powerfully. I tramp a perpetual journey. Come listen, all. I lead no man to a dinner table, library, exchange. But each man and each woman of you I lead upon a knoll, my left hand hooking you round the waist, my right hand pointing to landscapes of continents and the public road. Not I nor anyone else can travel that road for you. You must travel it for yourself. We hope you enjoyed this first episode of Small Changes in Teaching, Big Results in Learning by John Fanzalo. Please remember that this is an edited version of the book. To get the full experience, consider buying a hard copy or digital copy available from Amazon, which features all of the chapters and diagrams that we couldn't recreate in audio form. It also includes links to the videos that accompany the book. However, if you run an internet search on Small Changes in Teaching, 
big results and learning videos, you should find them easily, hosted on the ITDI website. Okay, we'll be back soon with a new episode featuring another chapter of the book. Thanks for listening and take care.